All right. Good morning. Good morning. We want to begin this morning. If you're in the back, feel free to come on in. And uh, we want to begin our worship this morning by standing together, if you can, and singing, Oh, Praise the Name, Anastasis, which means resurrection. <laughs> Feel free to sit if you need to sit.
start out, the very first words of that song say, I cast my mind to Calvary. And when you think about that, what does that mean? It means I look back, I think back to Calvary. And then it continues on where Jesus bled and died for me. And I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. And the song continues to tell the story about the sacrifice that he made. But then on the third day at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trampled death, where's your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. And then it goes into the chorus of, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. So, and then at the final verse says, and then someday he's going to come back, right? He's going to return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I'll rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. And so as we think about that this morning, as we continue to sing, as we hear the word preached, just consider those things, the fact that Christ, if we gaze back at Calvary, all that he did and what that means to us, and the fact that someday, if you're trusted in him, when he comes again and brings us all up to be with him, we will be able to praise his name forevermore. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you so much. We thank you so much for the cross and for what that means to us, Lord, as Christians. The fact that without the cross, that sacrifice that you paid, we'd be dead in our sins. But Lord, because you took our sins and went to the cross and was, our sacrifice, was a sacrifice for us, and then you overcame death, and now you're seated at the right hand of the Father, Lord, that someday we'll be able to be there with you, gazing into your face. We just thank you for that. And Lord, as we continue to sing this morning, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Thank you that we can praise you. Thank you that you love us. And thank you for all that you mean to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Savior, I come to Thee. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. I always look forward to God's gift to his people. First day of the week, the day of Christ's resurrection. We get together and sing praise, fellowship with each other, learn together, uh, and it's part of God's way of saying, I'm sharing my life with you together, and so we're delighted that you're able to be with us here today. Um, as we try to do each week, uh, choose an area restaurant if you want to spend some time having some fellowship and a good meal together. Right after the service today, you can go to KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, and then a reminder again uh, that uh, we have on uh, Wednesdays at 6 o'clock, we have the Awana for the children, we have Engage for the teens, we have a men's group, uh, and that's just a very special time during the course of the week. But other things are taking place uh, on the Wednesdays as well. The women meet with Tracy in the morning. And we just started uh, prayer meetings on Tuesday night here. And we want to encourage you to keep that in mind as well. This Saturday is going to be the opportunity for us to celebrate the life of Bob Sullivan. Now, Bob went home to be with the Lord actually about a couple months ago. But just for, with everything involved... This will be the time for the memorial service. It will be this Saturday. It's not the time that we oftentimes meet for a memorial. It's not going to be at 11 o'clock with a meal at 12. It's going to be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And then a meal will be following that. Uh, and so uh, we would ask you if you would like to help us in that. There's a sign-up sheet uh, in the table to sign up for desserts for that meal. Uh, after the uh, service, so uh, keep that in mind today. And then early, you know, in, in uh, May, uh, actually it's always the first Thursday in May, is the National Day of Prayer. Uh, and uh, so uh, here in Columbia, you meet at the uh, Town Green near the flagpole uh, at, what is it, 7 o'clock for that. Some of us in Willimantic also meet in the Town Green uh, Memorial Park at noontime, if you're in Willimantic and you wish to attend that one, but we will be having one here in Columbia. Um, we have a, a special person to, uh, to give some important announcements next, and so I'm going to stand down and let Bruce come up and share some things with us. I don't want to get yelled at by Sandy for now holding the mic up here, so I will hold the mic and make these three announcements. These are very important ones for our teens, and then one for the younger ones also. But on May 3rd, we are going to be holding a teen rally at 6 o'clock Friday night. That's on May 3rd. All right? There will be refreshments. Seven Admirals, in conjunction with Word of Life, is going to be here. There will be games. There will be the message put out. There will be more games. There will be snacks. Did I forget anything? No, I think I got it all. Huh? Board games. Moa. You talking about my Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, uh, accent here? Okay. And the next one we got. We have a fundraiser coming uh, uh, for the teens and also for the younger ones. 
and it is going to be a bake auction, which uh, Fred and, uh, man, I forgot her name now. Fred, what's your wife's name? Terry. 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 I knew that. <laughs> I knew it as soon as he said it. But Fred and Terry started this a great long while ago, and we're going to start it up all over again. So on the 19th, Sunday, May 19th, we're going to be holding a bake auction. There will be a live auctioneer. R.J. Weston has said that he would be here to do the auctioning for all the baked goods. So if you want to and you would like to donate a baked good for that uh, auction, please see me or Sandy. Let us know. And this way here, we'll have a rough idea on how many uh, baked goods we're going to be giving out. Not giving out. We're going to be selling. Okay? And Terry has already said that she would be doing her strawberry rhubarb pie. Oh. Okay? Yeah. And if you haven't had that before, you'll be here to bid on it for that one. The last one I got is summer camp. Summer camp for the teens and the youth, all the way from six years old to 18, maybe 19 if they're still a senior in school, okay? The cost is in the bulletin on how much it costs for each age group. There's three different age groups that will be going, okay? You'll have to see Sandy or myself, let us know, but there is a QR code in the bulletin that you could scan and register your child. There is a discount for anybody that registers prior to April 28th. I know that's a short time frame, but that's what I've got. So if you register your child to go to camp before the 28th, there is a discount. And these fundraisers that we're going to be doing for the youth will also go for that discount. All right, any questions? See Sandy or myself, and we'll be glad to answer them for you. Next. <laughs> okay, I'll be next. Okay, before we go to prayer, I want to ask the, uh, the children I uh, can leave for Children's Church and enjoy uh, the ministry uh, that they're going to have with some adults, okay? So. And I mentioned one other thing before we go to prayer, and this is a, uh, an update I mentioned about uh, Donna Highland. She had, had, she had fallen down and had uh, a break in her right arm and in her right leg. Uh, and presently, she is at Mansfield Rehab. We had the opportunity to go and spend some time with her this week. And she told us that the information they gave her is that she would be at rehab until May 1st. So uh, if you want to take the opportunity to have a visit with her uh, at Mansfield Rehab, just keep that in mind, and the rest of us will just continue to pray for her ongoing healing. Okay. Let's join together in prayer. Lord, as we come to worship you, we want to worship you today as one who is holy. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. We bless you that you are unlike anyone else. There is no one like you. You are supreme in every way. You are good in every way. And we bless you for that. We bless you that you love what is good and righteous and true because that's who you are. We bless you that when you sent your son, Jesus is known as the righteous and holy one. And yet he came to be a savior of sinners such as we are. And we thank you that, Lord, that in your holiness you had to deal with our sin, but in your love, the Lord Jesus himself took that burden upon himself. And we bless you, Lord, that as we come to know Christ, it is for the purpose of transforming us and helping us to live our lives no longer for ourselves but for you. 
And so as you tell us in Scripture, you shall be holy for I am holy. We come today and ask that you will continue your ongoing work in our lives, making us a step at a time more and more like the Lord Jesus and therefore more holiness within our own lives. Give us that heart's desire and we bless you for that. But we also want to remember today, Lord, that you are the sovereign of nations. You are the king in this world. And we are in a world where the fallenness and the hurt and issues of sin are all around us in so many ways. And specifically, Lord, to you as the sovereign, we want to pray about all that is taking place in the nations, most specifically in the Middle East. We think, Lord, about October 7th and the horrific slaughter that Hamas did upon so many Jewish people and then taking hostages as well. And we think about a group like Hamas that hides behind their own people and treats the Palestinian people unjustly. And we see so much more hurt and evil that is going on there that they are involved in. And so we ask, Father, that you will work in the hearts of those who are in leadership positions, whether they know you personally or not, that they would recognize that you are God and we are very needy in this world. And we ask that those who have responsibility and authority would regularly come and seek you for wisdom. For wisdom so that justice can take place and for wisdom to know how to show compassion to the many people who are hurting in so many ways. And Lord, as we keep up with the news and we see what is taking place, let us always take that as an opportunity to pray, O God. In judgment, remember mercy. Come and bring about what is good in this very fallen world. And a reminder for us to always pray that we want people to hear about the Lord Jesus. And we're so grateful that someday you will bring this all to an end, Lord, when you come back again. But in the meantime, (coughs) we pray (coughs) for your mercy and grace in so many ways to all the people in this world. Lord, as a local ministry, we want to thank you that you give us the chance not only to meet together on the Lord's Day like this, but to meet together together during Bible studies on Monday night or prayer meeting on Tuesday or Bible studies during Wednesday during the day and and Wednesday during the evening. We thank you, Lord, that you give us many opportunities to be together and to learn together and encourage one another and to pray together. And so we ask, Father, for that ongoing work within all of our lives and in our church. And we know this coming Saturday to have a memorial service for Bob Sullivan, who has been part of our church for so many years. We're thankful that he is in your presence. But for the family, especially in this memorial, um, so many things will come to mind, and those of us who've known Bob for so many years, we pray, Lord, that you would bless in all the preparation and the actual memorial service itself and in the time of fellowship together afterward. that we will be able to celebrate his life as someone who knows the Lord Jesus Christ. And we also thank you, Father, as a church. We are committed to missions in different ways, and today in particular we want to think about uh, Lucille's grandchildren. Thank you that Telly has been on a mission trip to Costa Rica, and then starting today, her siblings, Jed and Quinn, are going to be going to Puerto Rico. Thank you, Lord. Uh, It's just characteristic of their family. They want to be involved. They want to serve in very practical ways. And so I pray that you would bless the three of them as they are involved in this mission trip for safety, coming and going, and for bearing fruitfulness and just the joy of serving Jesus in this way, in that particular case, to do so in other countries at this point. But thank you for the pattern of this family as a whole, that they believe in love showing their love for you and serving other people. And we also pray, Father, for wholeness and healing for us. We think about Donna, the break in the arm and the leg, uh, and we are grateful for the progress that she is making physically. Thank you very much for her heart attitude. She's just sort of overflowing, and 
joyful in you, and we're grateful uh, in the midst of any hardship to have an attitude of peace and joy, and you've very much given that to her, and we're very thankful for that. There are other people that we know of, Lord, who face different kinds of, of illness. We just got a call this morning from a family friend, and we just want to pray, Lord, you know the specific situation that you will bring healing in their life. And Lord, you know that all of us face such a variety of areas where we need to be able to trust you and ask you to come and work. We need you every hour. We need you every day. We need you every week. And so what we just sang, we ask that we will experience you as God who comes and works within our own lives. Help us to grow in our trust in you. Because you are so inviting, Lord Jesus, your response is come to me. If you're heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. And so whatever it is we're facing right now, Lord, and you know our hearts, that we will respond to that invitation and we will come and experience you, Lord Jesus, working within our hearts and then working through us to show your love to other people as well. Thank you, Lord, for this day, first day of the week. Thank you for a weekly reminder that Jesus is alive. He's resurrected after the power of an indestructible life. And may you share out of that life with each of us today in the ways in which we need to experience you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All of us, over the course of our lifetime, have faced a variety of different challenges. And the reality is, in the coming days and weeks and months, we're going to continue to face challenges, maybe some that we faced before, maybe some that we haven't. <clears throat> but let me just mention some of the common areas of life where we have or are likely to face challenges. Some of those will be in the area of family life, what it means to live our life out as a single person, or how we live as a married couple, or as parents, what it means to help each of our children as they go through different stages and phases. And there are different kinds of challenges that we face. Another area where we face challenges is in the area of health. And we pray for that regularly. Maybe it's because of illness. Maybe it's because of an accident. Maybe it's because of aging. But we need you every hour in those situations. Another area where we need to uh, face challenges, or we do face challenges, is in the area of our vocation. Maybe we have to get a new job and adjust to that. Maybe there's major adjustments within our own job. Maybe there are issues uh, with our boss or fellow workers. Maybe something has come up that's new and that we're facing. But uh, that whole area can be an area of challenge. Finances, <laughs> certainly. How do we pay for all the things that we need to, especially if our finances are limited? What do we do if we run into a major bill, which is just likely to be overwhelming for us, at least at the moment? What does it mean to plan for retirement? How do you set that money aside in the midst of everything? These are very common challenges. We face them before we're going to face them again. But the Lord knows that whatever we face, he is more than enough for that. And today we're going to continue on as, uh, in series on focusing on Peter. Brian and I finished uh, First Peter last week, and now we're going to move into Second Peter. And in First Peter, he was dealing with the challenge of Christians facing verbal abuse and persecution because they trusted in Christ. And sometime later, he writes a second letter to the same people there in Asia Minor, or what we would call Turkey. Uh, and this is a call to holiness. Because in that second letter, where they're going to realize that they are facing false teachers who are going to lead them away from the truth in Christ or encourage them to do what is unethical or immoral in God's eyes. And so he's writing this letter to call them to holiness. And the interesting thing is, and we're just going to be looking at the first 11 verses today, he begins with a, uh, an encouragement which is extraordinary. Verses 3 and 4 in 1 Peter 2 Peter 1, are verses I've gone back to many different times in many situations, and he's just saying, let me get started. Be totally encouraged with how God has planned to help you get through life. And so we're going to look at that. 
Uh, and, and there are several other themes that we're going to look at in those first few verses. But we're going to begin with this opening theme. God's great provision for everything. Not just for some things. Not just occasionally. God's great provision for everything. And these are found in verses 3 and 4 of 2 Peter chapter 1. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. That through them, you might participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So he begins his letter with a statement about the fact that God loves to give. He's incredibly generous. By his divine power, everything we need for life and godliness. Now, when he talks about his divine power, that's actually in the third verse. If you go back to the first two verses and you say, his divine power, who's he referring to? Well, in verse 1, he refers to our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in verse 2, he refers to Jesus as our Lord. So when he's talking about divine power, he's basically, well, God is God and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit... And yet sometimes you emphasize one or the other persons in the Godhead. In this particular case, he's basically saying, out of the fullness of his overflow of goodness, our God and Savior Jesus Christ gives. In fact, he has given us so much that no matter what we face in life, no matter what we are going through, everything that we will need for life and godliness he has already made complete provision, and he wants us to enter into that and to experience that. And the word that's used over and over in Scripture on that is the word grace. Grace is undeserved blessing freely given. And Paul especially talks an awful lot about grace. From Ephesians, for example, he talks about the salvation is to the praise of his glorious grace, that it's according to the riches of his grace, that by grace you have been saved through faith, is the gift of God. So he said, I want you to get this perspective. When you think about the Lord, think of him as this. He absolutely loves to give. Give beyond your imagination. Give in every single area. Give everything that you need for life and godliness. Think of him as he is enjoying giving. And then he spells out a little bit more detail. Everything that we need for life, now, we talked earlier about four areas of life that we have faced or are likely to face areas of God's help. Family, health, finances, vocation. Okay, those are four major areas of life, but that's not all of life. There's relationships. There's the need for guidance. There's our desire for encouragement. There's our need for wisdom. And on and on and on. You can take any area of life, and here's how God says... You're thinking too narrowly when you're wondering whether or not I can help you in this specific situation. Keep this in mind. Everything, everything in life, I have made provision for you. And not just every area of life, but every area for godliness. Everything pertaining to life and godliness. Which means in every situation that we face, God says, I know I can help you get through this better than you think you can because I'm there. I can bring you through this in a way in which I will bring honor and glory to myself and goodness to you, and don't narrow me down. Let me work in you. So we all face sin and temptation. We all have certain sins that we struggle with more than others. And the Lord says, it makes no difference to me which the area of temptation is. I will always give you enough to be able to live in spiritual victory over any temptation or sin that you face. Or he looks at the attitudes that he's developing within us because he wants us to become like Christ, and we think, I wish I were more like Jesus in this. I wish I had a better attitude towards it. I wish I could handle this. And he says, I have given you everything for godliness. There's not a single good desire that you have that I cannot meet and meet beyond your imagination. So stretch yourself. Be willing to think of how generous I am, everything relating to life and godliness. We say, okay, that's wonderful. Everything is available to me, but how do we actually make these gifts our own? 
And then he says, it is through our knowledge of him. Now, there's two different kinds of knowledge that are mentioned in Scripture. There is knowledge about, this is God's truth, and we know about these things, which is a wonderful thing, but it's not the word that's used here. The word that's used here is the word that means experiential knowledge. It means knowing what God is like by his own presence with us. When I looked at this passage this week, the first thing that came to my mind was Mary. You know, Mary and Martha. And Jesus is there at their home. And they are being served by Martha. But we're told about Mary that she sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. She basically just wanted to soak in his presence, okay? Experientially, she just wanted to take in who he was and all that he was saying. And I think about what does it mean to experience God personally? There is a hymn that has become special in my life. It might be new to you, might be very familiar, but it's entitled, Jesus, I Am Resting, Resting. And I want to read the first two verses of that hymn. Because this is written by someone, a lady in this particular case, who is experiencing God. She is enjoying his presence. And so these words come out of not just knowing about, which is true, but knowing God experientially. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Thou hast bid me gaze upon thee, and thy beauty fills my soul. For by thy transforming power thou hast made me whole. Simply trusting thee, Lord Jesus, I behold thee as thou art. And thy love, so pure, so changeless, satisfies my heart, satisfies its deepest longings, meets, supplies its every need, compasseth me round with blessings. This is love indeed. She's experiencing God, the deepest longings. There's love and there's joy and him meeting her. And whatever she's going through, she's able to rest. Jesus said, come unto me. I will give you rest in your soul. This is experiencing. And God says, this is the setting in which all the provisions that I made for you in every area of life and all the provisions I made to help you live godly in every single... It comes as you're experiencing me. Just open up your heart and come into my presence uh, and I will give you everything that you need. And Peter goes on to say, after he talks about provision for life and godliness... He has given us his very great and precious promises. Now, let's focus a minute on that word promise. A promise is a word or a pledge of what God's going to do in the future. We're we're grateful for what he's done in the past. But if you look toward the future, that's the area of of promise. God says, I will do this. And then we depend upon him. He's faithful and he carries things out. And so we come into situation after situation, and he says, now, I have met you back there. Now, here's a new situation. I want you to take hold of this promise. I will meet you there. Here's another situation. I give you a promise. I want you to reach out and go into the future, whether that's an hour from now or two days from now or three years from now, and you go into that, and I will be there, and I will meet you in the promises. So what does it mean to live by faith? It's to live believing that God will do what he promises to do. The book that has helped me the most, in fact, this is one of my favorite books, by John Piper. It's called Living by Faith in Future Grace. It's the most unusual definition, but a very good definition of what a promise is. A promise is future grace. What do I need? I need God's presence and his gift in my life. When? Well, in the next five minutes, in the next month, whatever it is, It's future grace. I'm going to trust in God because God makes different promises. And he tells us here that these promises are to help us in two major areas of life. On the one hand, the promises help us to participate in the divine nature. We'll look at that in just a minute. And the other is that these promises help us to escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. 
So let's just take a minute and think briefly about a couple promises in each of those areas. God says, I promise to do these things to help you become more Christ-like, okay? Divine nature. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, <laughs> okay? So we look at our life and we can many times feel pretty weak or drained or whatever the case might happen to be. And Jesus, oh, go into this. I have made it possible for you to experience my abundance in that particular life at this point. Reach out and trust me to let me work abundantly in your life. Or another passage along the same way is that God promises to transform our heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Uh, and uh, there are those moments where we look back and say, God, you're just so good. I mean, you really changed me. But there are other times we sit there and say, God, boy, unless you work in my heart, unless you transform me, I'm not going to get through this very well. And he says, trust me. Trust me. I can take that situation. I can transform you. I can make you more like Christ. Christ, just come. Lay hold of my promise that I'm going to do that. So the promises are designed, on the one hand, to help us to participate in the divine nature, to become more like Christ in character. But the other thing that Peter mentions that the promises do is that they help us to escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And so God knows that one of the things that we face, and we face it many times, is we face temptation to get into sin. So God says, I'm going to give you a promise to help you escape from that. Pretty well known, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. How many times, uh, in one of those songs, how oft we escape the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. No matter what we face, God says, you never have to sin. In fact, if there is a temptation that I know would overwhelm you, I won't let it come. I will only let you face things where if you turn to me, I will deliver you. So there's always that opportunity to escape, no matter what the temptation is. Of course, if we give into temptation, which we do, and sin, then his promise is if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive your sins and to you know, lead you in, into righteousness. But he wants to protect us from that. Here's another passage that deals with protecting us from things. And that is we face anxiety. And God wants to give us peace. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, because we believe he's, he's done it before and he'll do it again. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is a passage that has become a normal part of my life. And it's a passage that I pray frequently as I'm praying for people in the church. Because we all have things that cause us anxiety, and God doesn't want us to be overwhelmed by that, but to be able to have that replaced by peace. And I take that last phrase there. There are some times where I have a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Or there are times where my mind is going round and round and round and round on an issue in my mind. And God says, I can remove that sinking feeling and I can stop that whirlpool of thoughts and replace it with peace. You just come to me. I have promises. Just trust me and I'll be with you in that. Wonderful, wonderful passage. And I'm sure all of us have turned to it at different times. So God's idea is this. In experiencing me, I will let you know what it's like to become increasingly Christ-like as I work within you and protect you from the dangers spiritually that you're going to face on an ongoing basis. Everything pertaining to life and godliness I made available to you. And then Peter becomes much more specific. And he talks about specific qualities in our life that he wants to see us grow in each of these areas. These all come out of faith. I believe God, and I'm going to trust him for future grace. I'm going to trust him to work in my life in a variety of different ways. And this is what we read in chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. The issue of growing in godly qualities. 
for this very reason. Make every effort to supplement your faith, that's the foundation, with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Okay? So God says, out of this root, this foundation of faith, you're trusting in Jesus, okay? He wants you to build on that, and here seven, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's a very good list of things that he wants to build into our lives. So the first thing he says is that he wants us to trust God for the future grace of virtue. There's more virtue to be developed in our life than we have right now. It's a future grace. So the word virtue means moral excellence or goodness. It's the idea that the word of God tells us what is good from what is evil, what is right from what is wrong. And in Peter's day, there were people, just as there are in, in today, who would try to advance what is immoral or unethical in God's eyes, and they'll say, oh, no, this is perfectly fine. This is acceptable. In fact, if you really understand our culture, you will embrace this and you will live this way. And God says, no, here's what I want you to do. I want you to grow in virtue, in moral goodness. And the way in which you do that is you spend time, especially in the word of God, which is our source of truth about moral wisdom. And you let the word of God shape your conscience. And not just yours, if you're a parent, you want the word of God to shape the conscience of your children. God's sense of this is right or that is wrong. And God says, as you continually ask me to work moral goodness in your life and strengthen your conscience by the word of God, you will grow in the future grace of virtue. But that's just the first one. And then he goes to another one. He said, trust God for future grace of knowledge. All truth is God's truth. When Jesus was praying the high priestly prayer, this is what he said about God's word. Your word is truth. And so for us to grow in the grace of knowledge here, we spend time in the scriptures. And you've probably heard this before, but there's five major ways in which we grow in the knowledge of truth from scriptures. We read the scriptures, whether that's in a devotional booklet or whether that's reading a chapter or whatever. We study the scriptures. We can study on our own. We can study in a small group in Sunday school or, or that meets during the week. Third, we can listen. Hopefully, what Brian and I have to offer, other people that you might listen to on the radio or, or TV, if they're presenting the word of God, we grow by listening. The third is by, uh, fourth is by meditating. Meditation means you go over and over it again until it starts to become part of you. When we read, I can read a whole chapter in, you know, five minutes. But to meditate, I have a short section of scripture and I just go over it and over it again and again. What does it mean, Lord, when your peace is going to guard my heart and my mind? Okay, so I go over that until heart and mind start to become more part of me and knowing how he meets us. And the last way is to memorize scripture. Uh, and uh, sometimes we memorize scripture by some good Christian songs uh, that, uh, that have scripture put to music. Uh, other ways we memorize. But the idea is this. We keep in the word of God in these different ways. By reading, studying, listening, meditating, and memorizing. And God's word is truth. Now we live in a society where some people say, well, that's just religious truth. Or that's just your truth. I have my truth, you have your truth. Hmm. God's truth is objective and it's, it's true for everybody. And it's a solid foundation. So he wants you to grow in knowledge. Third thing he mentions is to trust God for the future grace of self-control. Self-control. We have to be able to learn to master ourselves, master our emotions, master our passions. Master what we focus our minds on. Master how we react to different situations. And one of the areas where self-control is very important is dealing with the issue of anger, which, of course, we all face in different ways in different times. But there's a wonderful verse in Proverbs that talks about anger. Um, Proverbs 16, 32. Whoever is slow to anger, that's a sense of mastery, slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. 
Now think back at that time. The greatest accomplishment a general could ever do in that time was to take a city. They're fortified. They're really difficult to do. And a general who actually captures a city, that's the highest thing that he could possibly do as a general. And God says, you know, a person who rules their spirit is greater than that. That's how important it is for self-mastery in that area. And uh, so, self-control. But he's not done yet. He says, I want you to grow out of faith to trust God in the future grace of steadfastness. Now, other translations use the word perseverance or they use the word endurance. The idea is that we face adversity or difficulty and we are able to stand firm in the midst of that. And yet as we look at other passages on endurance, it's not just grit your teeth, try not to break all your teeth, but grit your teeth and get through it. It's the idea that even in endurance, God can give us an attitude of trust and joy in him of taking us through it. For example, this is what we read in Colossians, where he mentions, we pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. And then he adds, may you be filled with joy. Doesn't say all the patience and endurance that you need and grit your teeth the whole time. God is able, because he deals with every area of God, let us actually help us to have joy in a situation that we would not normally have joy in. But he's not through yet. He says, I want you also to trust God for the future grace of godliness. What is godliness? Well, it's an attitude of reverence toward God that in effect says, God, you are so important that at various times in every day or in every situation, I want to think about you or respond to you and find myself maybe very brief prayers, but um, I want you to be increasingly the most important person in my life and my thoughts. One of the passages that has been most important in my life on this whole topic is uh, 1 Timothy 4, 7. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness or train yourself for the purpose of godliness. So God basically says, okay, what I'm looking for is not just sort of a moment that happens. I want there to be a habit pattern where you are so regularly seeking me and focused in on me that godliness becomes just your, your spiritual DNA. It, it's who you are. And how I apply that passage to myself, which I do consistently, and as I use this passage as I pray for other people as well. There are three areas of particular that are called spiritual disciplines that I find are most important. Seek to do it daily, certainly a number of times during every week. The first is there's always time for worship and praise. Every day I will praise you and bless your name forever and ever. There needs to be praise and worship and thanksgiving. The second is the scripture, whether it's reading the scripture or studying the scripture or whatever. That has to be part of that day, that week. And the third is prayer. Pray for ourselves, pray for our families, pray for our neighbors, pray for our people in the church, pray for people that we work with. So to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, if we want to grow in godliness, if there is a habit pattern of worship, of scripture, and of prayer, God says, my grace will come and make you more godly. But he continues on. The next is that we are to trust God for the future grace of brotherly affection. This is literally the word Philadelphia. Phileo is friendship love. Adelphus means brother, okay? So there is, he talks about, there is a kind of friendship love within the family. And we can think about that in a natural family. We can certainly think about that in our spiritual family. C.S. Lewis has a book called The Four Loves, four Greek words for love. And one of those words is the word phileo, love, friendship love. And he says, let me give you a picture of what friendship love is like. It's two people not facing each other. That might be true of eros love. But friendship love is you're standing shoulder to shoulder with somebody, and you're both looking in the same direction as something that you both have a common interest in. And your friendship is you have this interest that you have together. Uh, and so the idea of brotherly affection is those opportunities, for example, if you're involved in any kind of ministry situation, whether it's an ongoing ministry or an occasional ministry, and you're working with somebody else and doing that, that's, that's brotherly affection. That's, hey, we have this in common. Isn't this wonderful that we're able to do this together and we can help serve people in this way? 
And so he says, I want you to develop brotherly affection. And that's going to be shown in the side-by-side -side kind of activities that you have common interest in. And then he closes with the highest form of love. Trust God for the future grace of agape love. Agape love is supremely found in Jesus. Agape love says, I want to do what is best for that person. Now, I might not like that person. In fact, I might have some real difficulties with that person. But if God gives me agape love, God's attitude is stop thinking about the failings or difficulties or limitations in that person. Just ask me this question. What is the best thing for that person? Then you pray for that and you seek to do that. That's agape love. And there are times where the fact is agape love costs time and energy and sometimes money. But when God lays it on our heart, that's what's best for that person. This is what I want you to do. And so Peter it not only says God covers everything for life and godliness, not only says I give you all these promises to help us you know, grow in Christ's likeness and, and avoid sin, but I want you to develop out of faith to trust God's future grace to help you grow in each of these areas of life. And then, in his final verses in this first section, he talks about, I know that trying to grow in faith is a challenge. It's not easy. It's not easy. But you need to focus in on this and pay attention. And so our last theme is this. God has a strategy. Promise, warning, promise. That's God's strategy for helping us grow in faith. So the emphasis here is you need to spend time and effort on this. He talks about, you know, um, you are, it's the word being diligent. Uh, you are to work at this, to make every effort, I think is the phrase. Make every effort to grow in these ways. And God said, you say, well, you know, I thought God gave me all his power at work, yes, and then you want me to work hard too? I mean, are those going in opposite directions? No, they're actually going in the same direction. The Apostle Paul gives us a phrase that shows how much he brings together God's work in his life and his own strong effort joining together. 1 Corinthians 15. He talks about... Um, yeah, I'll get to 1 Corinthians 15 a little bit. Uh, but the idea of the grace of God, and I worked more abundantly than everyone else. And that emphasis on effort and working abundantly is actually something that we do as a ministry with our own children. On Wednesdays, we have a ministry called Awana, A-W-A-N-A, -A -A, okay? Which means approved workmen are not ashamed, A-W-A-N-A. -A -A. And that's built upon a passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Be diligent. In other words, you're saying, okay, work hard at this, your effort. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. And so God says, for you to grow in grace, for you to develop your faith, there is real effort that needs to take place. So how does God help us to grow in faith? Well, he has a twofold strategy. One of the strategies is promise, and the other strategy is is warning. So Peter comes back to this and he starts to promise. Promise, warning, promise in these verses. He says, first of all, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Okay, so we want to grow. We, we want to be fruitful in our life, okay? So what I'm going to do again is just list the seven different things that God wants us to grow in. And as I list them, I'm going to Take a moment afterward to say, think about this. Right now, we can all grow in all of these. Which one of those right now will be most helpful for you to become more like Christ? Okay, I'll go over all seven and just think, what is God saying to me right now? This is for you right now. Okay? Virtue. Knowledge. Self-control. Steadfastness. Godliness, brotherly affection, agape love. They're all good, and we all need to grow in every one of them. But at this point, what would the Lord say to you? And in preparing for this, I just spent some time before the Lord and 
Now, which one of these, Lord, do you know that I need right now? And he brought one of those to mind. What is he speaking to you about? Because it's God's desire for us to be effective and fruitful. Remember what Jesus says in John 15, the vine and the branches. This is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. God looks at us right now and he sees the level of fruitfulness, but he says, as good as that is, I'm not satisfied yet because I have so much more I want to do in you and through you. So keep coming back to me. Keep trusting me. And as you increase in fruitfulness, that's my promise is whatever you call upon, I'll, I'll meet you there. Trust me. I'll do what you ask me to do. Promise. But then he knows that, that sometimes we aren't walking close to the Lord. Sometimes we've started to drift. Sometimes we've been through a really painful experience and we're sort of distancing ourselves from the Lord in some way or another. So he gives us a warning. And the warnings are designed to shake us up. They're designed to say, look, there's danger ahead. Don't just keep on in this pattern. You need to turn around, repent, go back to where you were before. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. God says, Here's a way in which you can be aware as to where you're going spiritually. Are you aware that sin is still something you've been saved from and is still there as a reality? Now, I'm not at all suggesting that every 15 minutes we try to find something wrong and we confess. My point is, if we go through uh, four or five days or a week and we cannot recall a single time where we've felt the Holy Spirit convicting us of something and we've had to turn to God and ask for forgiveness for what we said or what we thought or what we did. We went for a whole week and we've never confessed to God. We're in danger. That, we're, we're, we're moving away because the Holy Spirit is not going to go for a whole week and say, I've taken vacation for a week. I won't get in touch with you for seven days. Try it on your own. See what you do. Holy Spirit is aware of what's going on and his whole purpose is to make us more like Christ. So at some point or different points, he's going to say, you need to repent of that. And in fact, I would remind you of this. One of the great benefits of having monthly communion, Lord's Supper, is that when we are remembering his death, it's death for our sins, that we have been forgiven. And it's a fresh opportunity to say, Lord, I don't want to continue in that. I want to live unto you in a way which is pleasing to you. So continue to deliver me from sin because you died for those sins. I don't want to live in these sins. And so that's a reminder for us. We need the Lord on an ongoing basis. And so the warning is there. And sometimes we need that warning. Sometimes it comes from a passage of Scripture. Sometimes it comes from a brother or sister in Christ who has the um, kindness and courage to say something to us about some issue in our life. And it's the Lord's way of saying, this is kind, but it's a warning. Don't keep going down. Bridge out. So turn around now. So there's the promise, there's the warning, and then he closes with a promise, which is God's primary way of encouraging us. I promise I will do this for you. And these are the two final verses in this section of 1 Peter, verses 10 and 11. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent, that's the word effort, all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's not only looking at us day by day and how we're growing more like him. He said, look, I'm also looking ahead, and I know at some point, whether it's at your death or at my return, you are going to come into my presence. And what I'm looking for is this. 
I want you to live in such a way that when you come into my presence, there will be a richness of my blessing. There will be a richness of my joy, Jesus says, you know. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And that's what he's looking for. We have lived and grown in such a way that when we enter the Lord's presence, it is well done. Good and faithful servant. Well done, son. Well done, daughter. How pleased I am with how your faith has grown. How fruitful you have been in your life. Even things you don't even think about, but were really important, and I will bless you for that. But I want to give you a rich welcome. And so that's God's promise. I will give you a rich welcome, but you need to go day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, and when your life is done, I want you to experience a welcome that, that is beyond your imagination. That will be an evidence that over time you have continually grown in trusting me to do all the things that I promised to do for you. So what I want to do right now is to close in, in a two-fold prayer. Because faith is the most important response that we can have. I'm going to have, a, first of all, a prayer. If anybody here or online has never yet made that commitment to Christ to turn your life over to him, I'm going to have a prayer that you will trust in him to be your Savior and your Lord. And then the second prayer is for those of us who do know the Lord. And we're all on the way you know, in different areas. And to pray that whatever it is that God is speaking to you about right now and saying, I have future grace, things I want to develop in your life, I want you to trust me more and let me work in your life more in this area. He knows what it is and so we'll pray about it. Okay, let's close in prayer. If you have not yet turned your life over to Christ, then silently in your heart you can pray something like this. Lord, you tell me in Scripture that we all fall short, and I certainly do, and I'm aware of those ways. I am not the person who can, is good enough to bring myself to you. I need you. I need you. I thank you that you are so willing to forgive me, and I confess to you, Lord, my sin, trying to live apart from you or without you at the center of my life. I trust you when you say those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I believe you're going to keep your promise. So as I ask you now to enter my life, to forgive my sin, and to give me hope of eternity, I thank you. It's a promise, and you always keep your promise. I turn my life over to you, Lord, and I pray to the Holy Spirit to enter my life. And over the rest of my life, make me a Lord like Jesus. In his name I pray. And if you're someone who already knows Christ, you've been listening to this, if there's something that I've said today, some passage of scripture, and the Lord has laid on your heart and said, this is an area, I want you to trust me more. I want you to grow more. I want you to believe in the grace that I have right there in front of you. And over the coming weeks and months and years, I want to bring that grace and make it real in your life. As we pray that specific thing, Lord Jesus, we thank you. You have given us everything we need for life and godliness. So work that in our life, just as you've been so faithful to work in so many other ways and so many other times and so many other areas of our life. You are a good God. You are a gracious God. You love to give. This day, will you give me more Christ-like attitudes and heart and manner. And I thank you. You are faithful. You'll keep your promise. And all God's people said, amen. Okay. So we're going to sing and that last verse focused upon the eternal entrance into God's eternal kingdom. So we're going to sing when we all get to heaven. Hymn number 514.
as we come to our close, let me remind you that this Saturday is the memorial service. Bob has been in heaven a couple months, okay? We're going to meet him there someday, but we do want to celebrate his life, and if you would sign up for the dessert for the meal afterward. And also, out in the uh, foyer is an offering box if you wish to give to the ongoing ministry here at Baptist Fellowship, okay? So let's join together in prayer. God, you are so good. You just love to give. Help us to live this day, this week, this month, and beyond, knowing that everything we need for life and godliness has been provided for us through Jesus. Help us to be people who live by your promises, looking forward to the future grace of how you're going to work in each of our lives. So we pray for a greater fruitfulness in our lives with a sense of joy and thanksgiving to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.